And away we go. We are at showtime. Oh, chicka 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 chung 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 chunk and all the little noisy sounds that don't yet apply. Oh, one of these days we're going to have sound effects in this and perhaps some appropriate music. I don't know. But at any rate, there we have Peter's wonderful opening, Troubles in Paradise, my medallion, my belt buckle with atomic symbols, Troubles in Paradise, the methodology of creationism, tortukanwordpress.com. It is a website. Go to it. Put it on your must-go-to list, must-download-everything, must-read list. Otherwise, it ain't doing a damn bit of good. Anyway, uh, today we are continuing the wonderful and exciting world of um, the um, uh, Contested Bones book by uh, Christopher Rupi and John Sanford, who are young earth creationists, but you'd never know it by this book. Um, I, I couldn't resist scampering ahead to their section on chronology, and it turns out they're not really telling us that they are endorsing a young Earth chronology. They're kind of just carping at particular uh, radiometric datings for certain uh, hominid fossils. Uh, so it's it's um, going to be a, a and I looked up there. Uh, I, I couldn't help but checking then of the um, uh, Australopithecus sediba chapter to find out whether or not at anywhere in there. They're drawing on uh, Todd Wood, the creationist's baromenology analysis that lumped them in with humans, and nope, they aren't made. So Samford isn't even paying attention to young earth creationism. Anyway, uh, 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 Cap Bruni is here uh, as uh, a, a, a shameless foil uh, yeah. to um, uh, respond to what um, I'm dealing with or, or uh, um, say, rein it in, Jim. Uh, we are, of course, into a new section of the book where they are discussing Homo erectus which as a cap reminded me, and I knew already, is a sort of word that gets little juveniles all pushed out of shape. So yeah. all you need to, to hit every buzzword is to have, we're going to discuss a science fiction story where Homo erectus pays a visit to Uranus. And then we can come, we can hit everything all in one fell swoop. But for those of you unaware uh, of what Homo erectus is, that's um, our genus is Homo which of course is another joke, you know, people, you know, <laughs> homosexual and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there's yeah. it, it, people who have a, a the attention span of toast or the juvenile nature of a four-year-old um, uh, would have trouble with these things. But anyway, um, uh, we're the species Homo sapiens, uh, the thinking uh, man, and uh, Homo erectus is the upright man, uh, not uh, relating to their penis. And um, uh, there are the immediate precursor species uh, to our bunch and a whole bunch of others. Um, it's uh, generally regarded on the phylogeny. Well, the neat thing about Homo erectus is that they're starting out in Africa as our genus has, uh, but they're the first ones to spread outside of Africa. And they did it a couple million years ago and, and spread with remarkable speed through Asia and over into Europe. They didn't make it to Austral Australia, which we will be pointing out <laughs> in uh, in the course of this show. And of course, they never made it to the Americas. And by the time uh, they were able to make it to the Americas, there weren't any Homo erectuses anymore. They were Homo sapiens living up in Siberia, and that cohort uh, moved across. So um, a lot of water under the bridge out here. Anyway, uh, Samford and Rupi being creationists, and most of the work apparently was done by Rupi, not Sanford. He pointedly acknowledged that he didn't really do much of the research on it. So all the sloppiness is presumably Rupi's fault. Um, I've, I'm constructing a bibliography because the book doesn't have one and I'm going through source by source uh, and tracking down the provenance of things and and um, uh, checking what stuff in. It's, they're, they're still averaging now only about a, a source and a half per page, which is uh, pretty thin. Um, they're only about a third of their sources are technical and a lot of them are not controversial in the sense they're basically repeating their content. So they're not disputing the content uh, and, the, and the content doesn't help their case. So it's just kind of a wash, but uh, in about a third of the technical citations so far, they're just making things about them that aren't true. Uh, I've, I've encountered a couple of websites that turn out to be non-existent now. And since some of them are fairly recent, uh, that's kind of a fascinating uh, a drop off. And, and one of them involved the, uh, the Australian thing that we'll be getting to in a bit. But anyway, I put up uh, some links to some stuff that's not in Sanford and Ruby's book uh, on uh, Homo erectus and systematics. 
And so there was a, a technical paper and then also a website that you can just see how much detail is required and how many specific uh, taxonomical characters are. If you can recognize most of the terminology right on your own, you're a better man than I, Gunga did. And uh, you'd have to actually go and research a lot of that stuff uh, specifically to get up to speed on this, which is an interesting measure because, boy, Sanford and company ain't getting close to that because they, they require there be no transitional forms. And so uh, Homo neanderthalensis uh, has to be basically us. And they're deformed human beings, strange mutants. They're perfectly normal, happy human beings that buried their dead and they were just normal human beings. That's not, think about it. That's what the, the last few weeks have been uh, going on about. Uh, oh. Now they're into Homo erectus and they don't want them to not be human beings either. Um, they, they were anatomically very close to us. They were tall, about our size range, whereas Australopithecines have been relatively short and um, uh, long leaf bodies. But from the neck up, um, if you were to see one on a bus, you would be looking askance. And the brain size is different and there's enough anatomical variations that no paleoanthropologist puts Homo erectus as just an odd variant of human beings. And so they, they insist in the book that they are going to offer all sorts of science evidence that's going to justify them uh, lumping Homo erectus as mutant or deformed human beings. And I'll be waiting to see if they actually end up doing that. But it's going to be a tough haul. Oh. So um, anyone can... Um, what, what did you know about Homo erectus, Cap? Um, mostly what I learned in biology, it was an ancestor or an earlier ancestor or... Well, there's a while back it was usually taught that was an ancestor or somehow we're descended or have a common ancestor with them. Um, and that the European line of humans had a minor amount of DNA in com of, of Neanderthal or I guess I'm getting Neanderthal and homework. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, the uh but that they're descended from us through there and yeah it's been a long time since i yeah that's basically yeah, that's, that's, so, yeah. that shows the educational system is working reasonably well yeah. uh yeah. that <laughs> if you if you imagine the uh, 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 yeah. the uh, initial human populations in the genus homo uh in africa and they're 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 constantly discovering just how varied they were in africa and how many regions they were bumping into in africa that they hadn't realized it, they were just not just in the south of africa as before but the main thing is, is that a couple million years ago, um, Homo erectus emerges and then proliferates like mad and spreads out outside of Africa, probably uh, due to some climate shifting that went on to where now they had an avenue of exit and migration. And obviously a certain amount of wanderlust too, uh, that uh, suggests a lot about cognitive abilities. They were the more sophisticated tool makers than their ancestors and that. And so they were very, very successful human being. Uh, um, uh, it, uh, or human, human hominid um, that ran on for millions of years um, it, as, a, as a successful species. That's longer than Neanderthals and way longer than us so far. Uh, so let's not count them out uh, on that. And um, uh, the, the various groups are now regarded as the local variations on Homo erectus. Uh, what was uh, talked about as Peking man and Java man uh, back in uh, the 19th century an early 20th century and still is referred to that way in antiquated creationist works, <laughs> um, that uh, those are ones that are now identified as um, the Asiatic models of uh, Homo erectus, of which a form, maybe Homo ergaster or Homo um, uh, or, um, uh, rudolfensis, uh, heidelbergensis, there's a whole bunch of other uh, subgenuses yeah. going on here, uh, species that are branching off into varying groups. And nobody in the modern paleoanthropological biz is under the impression we've got all the data blips. So every time you add a new data blip, you refine the picture in the model. But Homo erectus has stayed a nice, stable bunch. And the fact that they remained effectively the, the big kid on the block uh, for such a long period of time is interesting. Uh, whenever you get into uh, transition nodes, uh, you tend to find almosts and things that are hard to classify. And so you get turf wars over whether you want, you want to lump them together or have a new name involved. And that's all a dead giveaway that you've got variations 
that are outside the pale of what you're used to within the thing. And so now you wonder, have you actually seen a speciation event or not? That's how you would identify speciation processes. Is suddenly you've got things getting murky taxonomically. Yeah, but RJ, don't don't you listen to the creationists? Homo erectus was just an old man with arthritis. Oh, that was Neanderthal. Oh, that was that, the, okay, Neanderthal. okay. Yeah, I, yeah. Homo Homo erectus. They're saying they were they were tall young men with with uh, deformities. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're, they're getting a wrinkle on this. The fun part is is to see the shell game going on because the, the creationists cannot allow transitional forms. They cannot allow almosts. Everything has got to be A or B. It's either human being or not human being. And uh, to, to, sell, to show them willing to accept Homo erectus into the club uh, as a human being when we know so much about it and also without them ever really come through about the chronology is another matter. I, there was a paper that I put up, uh, uh, Indrati's paper, that's uh, a follow-up on the um, uh, Homo erectus survival uh, in um, Indonesia. And um, it, they don't cite that paper, by the way, in their book. But what was intriguing to me is the geological context. Because if you look in it, you'll find that there's references to pumice in the deposits. If you look at the stratigraphy things, I keep great, wonderful attention to all this because that's volcanic ash. And as we know, Indonesia is just chock a block with volcanoes. It's on the uh, ring of fire and it, it's still uh, as most of the volcanoes of the world are in uh, that region today. Um, and Krakatoa and all that. I mean, everybody knows about these fabulous examples. Well, if there's volcanic ash, that if that is in these layers, then how could that be flood? So you've got a serious problem here with 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 airborne ash sloshing down with the spigot turning off and the water receding, uh, and it, it it literally doesn't occur to Rupi and Sanford to defend their young Earth creationism to apply it. They're, they're dishonest. They're they're not yeah. trying to think through. Their argument, for, if they want to believe the, young, the flood geology, if they want to believe in a young earth, fine. If they want to believe in created kinds, fine. But defend them. Work through what you think happened. Be explicit on chronology and be willing to account for every scrap of information. So when they would read about one of these paleontological instances, they should be applying their model meticulously to it and uh, uh, have no problem whatsoever in doing that. So wait, RJ, are, are you telling me that these creationists are not honest? Oh, the humanity of it all. <laughs> I know this is a, this is yeah. a constant disillusionment amongst us. Well, I, I, dishonesty is not the right word I would use for it. Uh, th there's that Tortukan mind shell thing. It's that Functionally, they can't work out. Their brains are never going to be able to come to a grip with systematics. They can't work out um, what the uh, uh, created kinds are. They can't work out the, the details of the flood event uh, because there's just too much data that can never fit. And uh, um, uh, as Robertson, uh, Robert Richardson yeah. puts out, created kinds, speciation at 10,000 times the rate yeah. goes by evolutionists. Yeah, uh, yeah. that that there's one of the, the things that you that is revealing about the nature of anti-evolutionism, that creationists are forced by the flood model to figure out how you get the kinds on the ark and how many kinds there were, and then what happened to them afterwards to turn a small number of kinds into all the observed species we see today. Yeah. Yeah. So they gotta have hyper fast speciation. Now intelligent designers and old earth creationists don't have that problem. So they don't think about it at all. They literally yeah. don't bother about how many I, kinds there are. They don't bother about the sequencing of events. It's all just a the designer designs stuff at a point in the past somewhere or other. Yeah, and that's I, about as far as it goes. I, I remember I got into it with a uh, with a yak one time, and they were trying to argue that well, dinosaurs were on the ark and everything else like that. And I'm like, all right, fine. Then tell me why we don't find dinosaur fossils anywhere close to what we know today why would they all die and then dig themselves way way down deep and then fossilize where's the skeletons or remains of these dinosaurs that were on the ark i never 
got an answer on that one. Um, no, but, and uh, that would be another matter of, of what the, the archetypal one. If um, we have the observed diversity of dinosaurs in the fossil record, and so every one of them has to be accounted for. It's not like modern species. We're way off a of digression here, but I, I'm, I'm, I think it's kind of fun to deal with because yeah. a lot of people will know dinosaurs. Um, that when you've got existing life forms, you can theoretically have a kind of a archetypal form that was the thing aboard the ark, especially if it's an unfamiliar animal. I mean, kind of rinks or something if they feel like doing that. Uh, but, um, and lions and tigers and bears and dogs and cats, oh very familiar forms, right? Um, but um, all the fossil life, by definition in the flood geology, was a created kind because they're there to be killed in the flood. And so the, the best you could hope for was that some kind of spurt of speciation had taken place from the initial yeah. creation event down to the flood event, which is um, about 1500 years after creation. And uh, uh, that's interesting, but they don't really bother about that all that much. Anyway, back to uh, Homo yeah. erectus. Yeah, um, and, and I was gonna point out something that Robert said as well, and it deals with, Homo erectus and Homo sapiens said, look closely at the 300-year-old uh, recent uh, H. sapien finds in Morocco where they still have some H. erectus skull traits. And I'm like, yeah, I had seen that. That was like, I was like, wow, that's pretty darn cool. Yeah, that by definition, if our species originated out of the same initial speciation block that, that had to, uh, Homo erectus, we, we've still, in effect, got a lot of the genes and structure of that, but it's been millions of years ago that uh, yeah. um, that, that was um, uh, emerging from their precursors. And then our human species is an offshoot of that Homo erectus block much more recently. It's looking like uh, 300,000 years ago or something like that, as opposed to Neanderthals that split off um, about 700,000 years ago. And um, so obviously there's going to be genetic uh, um, structural components, but you still end up with a limited range for any breeding population of morphological features, which ultimately are related to genetic elements. And so it's not like the very thing that creation is like to remind you that there's not an infinite capacity for variation in a particular species. That's going to bite them when they try to deal with trying to cram Homo erectus into the Homo sapiens box. And yeah. I'll be intrigued to see whether he gets down to any other genetics uh, that, that uh, could possibly be justifying all of that. Anyway, uh, I mentioned Australia. And um, uh, what was interesting about it is that um, at one point, Rupi and Sanford uh, got a little ahead of themselves when they were arguing that, that Homo erectus supposedly lasted way longer than people thought and as recently as 20,000 years ago and cited a little reference. And the reference was to a website posting uh, from, I think, the University of Melbourne, which is, is I couldn't track down because it's non-existent now. And um, so I couldn't verify um, the content of their discussion but it looked like it was referring to the, the new dating on the cow uh, swamp um, Australasians. And uh, that uh, was a quite accurate um, redating to where the, the, the remains in, in cow swamp uh, skull uh, were um, much younger than they had thought. It was only a few thousand years old. Uh, and um, uh, that altered some of the dynamics of things. But they were acting as if there were a Homo erectus. Why? Well, uh, when I did some research on cow swamp, uh, it turned out that somebody who was pushing the Homo erectus, uh, the, the Aborigines are actually just variant Homo erectus or Homo erectus are just variant um, Aborigines, uh, was Marvin Lubinow, the creationist. And that, so I put up a posting to Jim Foley's uh, analysis where he tracked it back to Lubinow. And remember, Lubinow is the one and only creationist source that they've cited so far. <laughs> and so my suspicion is Rupi was soaking up a little too attentively uh, the worldview of, of Lubinow. And so when he read about this redating of the um, Aborigines, um, he mistook this for a reference to Homo erectus, when in fact, 
for decades, they've recognized that no, uh, no, Homo erectus never made it across the uh, the Sunda Strait uh, to uh, Australia. That it was much later when humans had much better boat canoeing and uh, came across. And it was quite a long time ago, 60, 70,000 years, Mungo Man and all that. It's quite, quite old, uh, way older than that. But, uh, but the, and another factor was when they were, they, they made the same mistake earlier in their book when they were drawing on older arguments that there were Homo erectus features popping up in the Aborigines. The kind of brow ridgy things and Neanderthal connections between these, you know, the, the, when in the old days when racists would be looking at the skull shapes and all that yeah. kind of stuff and making snap judgments. Th that uh, mm -hmm. there was a, a paper and Foley puts the reference in in his thing, so you can track it down from there. It's it's available open access if you want to uh, track it down. I didn't feel like putting it in this particular time, but anyway, it's about the fact that that the Aborigines would do skull deformation. And so that some of the things that were being attributed to genetic ancestral things were just cultural yeah. variations in and the same way Mayans had uh, the, the skull lengthening. This various cultures yeah. in various times have this weird thing about changing skull shape, especially for elites. And uh, um, that, that you have to pay that attention to that. And this, this um, uh, popped up in the 1980s. So what, what little effort there had been thinking that maybe there was uh, how, uh, Homo erectus is in Australia just fizzled out completely. And so by the time we get down to the 21st century, everybody but our authors <laughs> seem to be up on the, uh, uh, the take on yeah. this one. <laughs> Robert, Robert said something, and I completely agree with it. I thought the same thing when you were saying how they were saying the Aborigines were Homo erectus, and I'm just like, it, what he said was exactly what I was thinking. Wow, I had never heard anyone try to contend that the Aborigines were H erectus. That's so racist. And I'm like, yeah, I was it, like, and this, I, I was like, could you, you get back, any? I was gonna say, could you, you get any more racist? Is was my oh, thought. Oh, like, the 19th century oh, got way more racist. Oh, and I, the 20th I, century got way more racist. That that every uh, if you look at the Lombroso style, style skull um, things that were going on in the 1920s and that, and they were uh, categorizing everybody uh, according to their pecking order. Needless to say, white people came out on top always. Uh, isn't it odd how, how people tend never to attribute the, the most superior characteristics to a race other than their own? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, racism was just knee deep. Uh, in uh, paleoanthropology, and uh, it was only after the rather hit you in the face racism of the Nazis that that really forced the anthropological community to retool. And even at that, uh, some of the old style people were still act active uh, into the fifties and sixties, but they had to kind of shut up more. And uh, uh, as we moved on into the modern era, particularly once we discovered DNA, uh, yeah. now you didn't have to worry about um, uh, looking at, at gross uh, dynamic features, uh, morphological features. You could look at the DNA and you could track down what genes are producing what particular features. And that all completely altered the, the relationships of things. So, um, uh, but, but to find um, this, um, kind of paternalist uh, simplicity going on in uh, creationism uh, has been a common feature. There's also that hidden racism in creationism. Modern day, uh, your Ken Ham types will insist, that, oh gosh, no, we don't believe in racism in any way, shape, yeah. or form, and never did. And I'm going, <laughs> no, no. That, <laughs> right to the contrary, um, it, you, it, when you remember that, that creationism came out of Southern Baptist um, yeah. traditionalist culture, it spread into the hinterlands in the, in the uh, um, California bedroom communities and suburbs eventually, but uh, it still had its roots back there. And for a long time, it carried a lot of the same racist baggage that KKK 1920s anti-evolution yeah. has had. And so you don't want you you don't want mongrel niggers to be all your relatives. Those are yeah. the son of Ham, and uh, so you have uh, uh, that element is is in uh, creationist apologetics through the sixties. Yeah, and, and, and of it in the seventies, and it fades out after that.
Yeah, I was saying about as far as like the Cretaceous and all of them, you know, being not being racist. I'm like, um, it was the Christian, and, and a lot of them were obviously going to be creation. And I'm not saying that this is the case for all of them, but I know a lot of the Christian movement and a lot of the Bible verses that were used. But the 1960s to deny civil rights and uh, keep segregation. I mean, that was all straight up. You know, I mean, slavery. I mean. You can look at, you know, I mean, like this, I've said this before many times. The Bible can be used to either justify good or justify bad. It can be used in both. Yeah, and historical revisionists uh, try to parse the history first to fit a preconceived vision of the past. And they, they neglect to realize that, no, you got to pay attention to the whole thing and uh, uh not uh pay, play picky choosy on things so racism i mean there were there was a, a brand of scientific racist uh approach uh and uh, the discovery institute and others like to harangue on that part too um yeah. and you get also this kind of pseudoscience quasi evolution racism uh where uh, you use the word evolved hitler falls into that kind of a category but oh, is yeah. he a darwinian evolutionist that believes nope. in shifting alleles in populations yeah not no, really he was a social darwinist which believed that yeah. socially they Herbert were spencer. as evolved and which, um yeah. spencer uh, uh, was always kind of pushed out of shape that that darwin got all the credit on stuff because uh, um spencer uh came up with his more generic and harebrained notions um uh well before darwin and um the fact that darwin was operating in in the science realm and spencer wanted to apply it to a broader context then on the other side you've got ones that are usually attributed to being uh, a purely evolutionist atheist uh, the soviets um they believed in a weird branch of non-darwinian non-genetics uh yeah. lysenkoism where they thought basically everything was kind of, there was much more malleability to life that you could breed crops um that would uh um, survive in cold climates uh um, just by the right exposures of things i mean it, it's almost as bad as the bible thinking that you could make striped animals by putting them in front of of a picket fence yeah uh that yeah, it, it was that bad and it, it absolutely obliterated the um it crashed the uh, uh russian agricultural system because it was just claptrap and uh that, that it lysenko stayed in power as head of their its system until the 1960s he outlived stalin uh so robert was, says lysenkinism is biblical actually so <laughs> yep well it it was it's the notion it was it was also very marxist it was the idea that you that there were no inherited traits there were only um, the things that the culture put into them. So a, a proletariat version of genetics had to be that you could that you had a, a blank slate, and it's what the the culture produced, uh, all the traits that human beings had. Um, uh, another one that pops up that it, it's just a hilarious bit. Uh, yeah, I, I beat you to it, Robert, on the on the uh, stripe sheet. Uh, but Marxists also um, are equivalent to conservative Christians uh, in how they dislike homosexuality. For them, they couldn't wrap their brains around it any more than uh, Christians could. And so uh, you find uh, uh, Marxists uh, deciding that homosexuality will not exist in the uh, communist utopia. Uh, it's a product yeah. of capitalism. And uh, uh, um, the Iranian clerics uh, insisting there's no homosexuality in the Iranian uh, uh, theocratic mm -hmm. state. It just doesn't occur anymore. And you're going, no, sorry, it doesn't work I that way. I don't buy that for one yeah. second. And, and so that's, those are all examples of ideologies mandating uh, things that are supposedly true. And so, uh, we're, we're, which brings us back to sex and homo erectus uh and uh um, all the little funny names in there so uh what i then uh, had on those uh technical papers and the the bits off to jim foley and all the rest is some um, um a set of avenues that you can get into to kind of explore both the technical and non-technical side of some of this homo erectus issue and do your own research and stuff on it as well if you if you call up a, a recent um chart of um fossil data you're gonna find a thicket because you know you've got all of these other subspecies things but what they tend to fall into is interesting little nodal clusters 
And it's of the my view that most species, of course, tend to be very stable over time. Uh, they run along until finally they run out of steam or they may fission off a, a branch, but that doesn't mean they go extinct. They just fission off a branch because most speciation uh, is, uh, invertebrates at least, is uh, allopatric, which is by species uh, um, over geographic range, rather than sympatric, where A turns into B, which means A is gone. <clears throat> that can occur too, but it's way rarer. Yeah. And so um, uh, the Homo erectus then, uh, you could the, the 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 hardest difficulty for some uh, fuddy duddies to get their minds passed in the 1970s, but boy did they have to get used to it. Is something that uh, uh, um, Johansson in particular was saying. There's more than one hominid. There's more than one hominid species simultaneously. That they had to get past this single species obsession, where there would be just the group. And then it turns into the group, which then turns into the group and no overlap. Uh, we had gotten into that. I call attention to it in uh, Planet of the Apes. Uh, for those of you who haven't read Planet of the Apes, please read Planet of the Apes. It's at my website. It's a book length thing that kind of gives a good summary. And I think it holds up pretty damn well, even though I wrote it now about 10 years ago. And the newer data has to um, refuted any of it. It's just broadened. Uh, the scope we have more even more blips on the scope but the old single species model uh, was just a problem uh for the field because um the speciation dynamics meant that you could have multiple uh, branches existing simultaneously so you could easily have a circumstance where homo erectus was coexisting with another hominid species and uh later on human come along on the scene at the uh, and homo erectus doesn't disappear and then the other issue is how much interbreeding or all could happen um, yeah. the, I, I would suggest that, that um, because of the zygotic isolation mechanisms and the chronology involved, that it would be increasingly unlikely for Homo sapiens to be able to interbreed with any of the Homo erectus cousins that, uh, because the, the, the split was taking place too far back that there had been so much variation going on. Uh, although we would have come from a Homo erectus lineage, uh, the other cousins living off in Asia and other places, by the time we bump into them, assuming that we, we do in some cases, like Homo florensis, a little hobbit critter, looking like it's a, a dwarf form of um, uh, Homo erectus in the current view. Um, and of course, Homo neanderthal, we were able to interbreed with them. That, but, uh, and so there, theirs was a split that was taking place around 700,000 years ago. So it all depends on the detailed gene flow. What I would still be surprised if someday they could find enough or reconstruct genetically what Homo erectus's genome was. I doubt it uh, in detail. Uh, you could get some rough heuristics based on our genome and Neanderthals to kind of work out the kinds of stuff that might've been knocking around in ancestors, but you know, the, the, the things can work rather faster. But um, whether or not they might be able to find some um, more, uh, the, the last surviving Homo erectus population where you would be able to get some actual genetic information out of it, um, not impossible, but I'm not holding my breath either. And yeah. so uh, that's probably going to have to be paleogenomic work rather than direct gene flow. But Svante Pebo, uh, the guy with all the umlauts in his name, um, uh, has surprised us before. So <laughs> uh, uh, the amount that when I when I was a young whippersnapper, uh, you had no Neanderthal DNA to look at. Uh, when I was in that same frame, I had no idea whether there were any planets around any other stars in the universe. Now we are chock a block. So, uh, you know, science can develop all sorts of wonderful stuff. So it, yeah. we're a little bit past, uh, our halfway. Let me put up my, okay. my shameless plug here. And, um, so what is you so far about the, the program, uh, Mr. Cap? Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm learning a whole lot, not just from you, but also from uh, Robert in the chat. He's been, <laughs> he's been, you know, very, you guys are both very knowledgeable, I'll say that. Um, but yeah, I was going to say, it's amazing how much we've learned in just such a short amount of time with the advancements of science. Yeah, th that's why I'm very keen to remind everybody, don't for a moment forget we live in a golden age of science. Oh, yeah. That... Uh, we have access 
everybody who has a smartphone or internet has access to a level of technical information that is gobsmackingly spectacular not not just commentaries yeah. and crap and therefore nobody should be limited to listening to idiots you you have yeah. too many of the real scientists and the real work directly available that if you're uh, uh, as an extreme case somebody who who swears by alex jones you know you want to whoop him upside the head what an idiot how dare you rely upon twaddle when we've got non-twaddle uh, so easily available anyway um here are my patrons for uh, um, my uh, project here um at um uh, the uh, patreon steven and dyer and eat and yui and mona and hendrel and jen and jody and daniel and ralph and eric and benjamin and staggles alex tot real everett and paul thank you all and uh here is my website again put it on your bookmarky things and download the damn files and read them i know the pdfs are large uh, but uh, there's a lot of stuff in there and do it at your leisure. Tell people about it. If they have questions, they can pop it to me uh, uh, there at the website, uh, which I check all the time uh, or by Twitter. Uh, you can pick my brain on Twitter. You, if you have some question where you've heard about some claptrap or some odd example, uh, something about what about that? And you don't know about it. You can quiz me. I know um, uh, Apologia makes use of my work. And if so, anybody who admires Apologia's videos, he makes use of tip. He know, uh, realizes that the, the method works, and I've got a long data source for things. He always he and Jackson uh, put their scripts by me, uh, and I learn from them, uh, and they learn from me, and together we are smarter than we were before. And that's the neat thing about this networking thing, uh, is that uh, we have the tools to be smarter collectively than we could ever be individually, but we're not yet up to speed as to how efficiently to use it. Uh, I will call attention to the GoFundMe.com DC Go because the old RJ is a retiree person on Social Security with no other income other than my books and or the GoFundMe kinds of things to keep me going to buy things like ink or someday maybe a new pair of shoes uh, mm -hmm. and pay bills and stuff. So uh, if you, if you uh, favor my work and you think what I'm doing is important, let me remind you uh, that I am... Uh, doing um, research that literally nobody has ever done before. If I were just reinventing the wheel uh, and retreading National Center for Science Education or something like that, it'd be one thing. But by a variety of reasons, I've stumbled into a measurement that's never been done before, which is what's the science base of anti-evolutionism? What sources have they relied on? How much of the science field have they bumped into? Nobody had way to know that before but i'm literally measuring uh, source by source by source and uh, so it's a situation where i can tell you that 95 percent of anti-evolutionists don't cite primary sources that the five percent who do two-thirds of them just get it secondarily from somebody else that the core group of only 50 people who make up the shit uh based on primary source data uh are bumping into only about 10 percent of the data field these are, I think, kind of relevant numbers, and it allows you to target criticism in a way. One of the reasons why I wrote the slam dunk book is that there wasn't anything on the reptile mammal transition. How come all these stupid things that I had spotted uh, from the uh, creation of screwing up on the reptile mammal transition weren't part of our lexicon? Why weren't we noticing all the dumb things that the Discovery Institute uh, writers had written in their books about the uh, reptile mammal transition? Uh, and uh, so uh, if you if you have that under your belt, uh, now you've got ammo to where you can pick your targets and deploy the targets efficiently. So uh, the one thing that I'm still hoping for, and we're nowhere near it, is an active science strike force network where um, every creationist in on the planet should be just terrified at the prospect of opening their trap because they will know that the science strike force is going to be down on them in social media in direct uh, discussions at public meetings any venue that they can't do their claptrap <clears throat> without pushback and inform pushback where we know more than they do we know their arguments more than they do we know the science data better than they do and so we're comfortable and calm and serene as we drop anvils on them because we know all the stuff at um 
Yeah, Robert asks, um, yeah, that's what I was asking about at the beginning of the program. How can they look themselves in the mirror after someone points out the errors like that? I, I can I can answer it. Because they have God on their side and the Bible is never wrong. Even when even when it's wrong in the basis of reality, the Bible is right because no matter what, it can never be wrong. I, yeah, you've got yeah. you've got part of that element. Uh, Todd Wood would be a beautiful example of that. Um, he's a very bright creationist, arguably one of the brightest and sharpest and most scholarly of the creationists in a field that has virtually none of that. Uh, he's he's fair with his sources within his niche, and he will concede a bunch of things. He'll say, "No, evolution is not a theory in crisis. Stop saying it is. There's actually lots of evidence for evolution." And you're going, "Why then are you not an evolutionist?" Well, because he's a young earth creationist by conviction. So yeah. even though the evidence supports evolution, it can't be true because he knows what the truth is because the Bible says so, at least in the versions that uh, of what he's been taught. And whether or not he's ever going to have like an epiphany to where he goes ah, la, 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 and, and yaggedy, 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 and, and realizes um, how weird that is, I don't know. He may go all the way down to the end of, of things. But if, you, if you're a Tortugan mind, what I'm positing is that there is a component to that mindset that's totally unconscious that is the equivalent of, oh, don't you don't want to think about that. No, no, no. Calm down. Calm down there. Think about, oh, that's better. Think about that. That makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And all this is occurring unconsciously. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Robert says that I totally, utterly screwed up my source citations and missed major elements of the reptile mammal transition I claim doesn't exist. But God, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's that, I, that's what I would like to force people onto that argument. Yeah, because uh, the reptile mammal transition is the kick butt example of a transitional sequence. Yeah. It's got none of the squishy parts that you find with some other elements. The the bird sequence has to this day very sparse data for the early Jurassic, uh, the thing leading up to Archaeopteryx. You've only got fragments of this and that, and, and you can do a lot of systematic analysis and that, but, but there's just only so much you can do because small critters of the form that would have been producing the precursors to Archaeopteryx and their ilk are really poor for fossil preservation. And uh, do, are, are we getting feedback yeah. from somewhere or other? I, uh, I, I got... Here, let me. Um, I think I'm off on my uh, uh, screen, but if you're if you're having yeah. me monitoring somewhere else, make sure that you've mm -hmm. got me on mute on there. Yeah, I just because otherwise I we're, we're getting my, two of okay. me, which is worse than one of me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just turned down the volume on my headset, my control, because sometimes it it's sometimes sensitive it will pick up. So hopefully that will will do that. But yeah, on uh on on what. With, with the Tortucan in that, I really truly believe that most of these people who have actual legitimate PhDs um, actually know the information. This just, they can't accept it. Like, um, one I'll point to, because I, I see a lot of her because of AIG and that, but Dr. Georgia Purdom, she knows this information. I don't know how she can know this and not accept evolution as fact as it is it's just they um i, I just well there is an ability to parse that. there's an ability to well that's a puzzle uh there's an ability uh, it, it's the equivalent um uh, there, there are some bible believers that i come into who are um uh, they they're firmly convinced the flood happened and you ask well when did that happen and they go i don't know Aren't you curious? No, no. Bible says it happened. It's fine. I don't really care when. Yeah. And if you have a mind like that, that even no matter how much data there may be theoretically, that it's just a series of isolated stuff. <clears throat> I call it in the in the old book, um, a, a Zeno slicing. Um, you're familiar with Zeno's paradox? No. Uh, it's a, one of the famous paradoxes. Zeno was a smart ass Greek who uh, thought he proved that motion was impossible. And he had a thing where Achilles and the tortoise are in a race. Uh, Achilles uh, from the uh, Greek um, um, Trojan War. And, um, and so the, Achilles gives the tortoise, 
uh, gives the tortoise a head start and the tortoise moves ahead some distance and Achilles gets up to that speed uh, location and at that point the tortoise will have moved forward a little more and if by the time Achilles reaches that point the tortoise would have moved on a little more and so that means he proved that you that Achilles could never pass the tortoise and you're going uh really and what it turned out of course is that effectively what he was trying to do was add an infinite series because the amount of, of distance the tortoise was doing was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and, and you're having an infinite regression so you were trying to do an integral calculus and they didn't do integral calculus in the greek age so yeah. uh, when you do that boop, and work out velocity and distance covered and so forth you can calculate exactly when uh achilles will pass will eat meet where the tortoise actually is and pass the tortoise and be able to calculate where each one of them will be assuming their velocities remain the same uh and if you want even if you assume varying accelerations for the tortoise and hare you can even calculate that you're just dealing with higher level intervals and blah 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 um and so what but what i i describe that as xeno slicing is when you you parse up a data field so that nothing connects to anything because you, you you think about how fast Achilles is running and how slow the tortoise is. Of course, he can pass the tortoise. And so this is clearly a trick of, of the fact that you're parsing and slicing things up so much. And that's what you find with the bright creationists. Yeah. That they will know data, that, that airborne volcanic ash example, that, that will be literally under their nose. Or um, with... Um, uh, Michael Denton, in his new book uh, on uh, anti-evolution, um, Evolution, Ace Theory is Still in Crisis, uh, where on the reptile mammal transition case, he literally had to step over the information that blew his argument smithereens. And I personally think that he never got past the abstract of the article, that it didn't get to the point of where he really read the article attentively all he was trawling for was for the information that he needed for his narrow point which was about supposedly bite force uh in playing out as a, a, a supposedly the driver for the jaw transition which wasn't true and was irrelevant uh because of the diapsid versus synapse and things and all of that there's a whole bunch of things that made his analogy a bad one to begin with but that was terrible because the source he had had the information in it yeah. now he's not a stupid guy and yet um something about his brain and it can't be because of religion because he's not a religious person he's an agnostic had to be insulating himself from looking too close that he had an object of desire that's where this tortukan concept comes in that basically makes him not think about things other than that so it gives them a degree of sloppiness uh and what you tend to find is that that the scientists that have this tendency and it's not restricted to creationists um end up not being as big an impact in the sciences as they were in spurts um to some extent um newton probably had a tortukan streak and he, he was quite a, a jerk on a lot of things uh in later life uh he denied the ability of a clock to tell longitude um and he insisted it was physically impossible and all of that he was just a snarker on it um uh, and it, it argued that that most of his major accomplishments were made before he was like 25. so you know the young newton was a boat rocker and innovator and the increasingly older newton was an old fart who was obsessed with biblical prophecies and all that kind of stuff so uh but you find it with um uh, fred hoyle uh, brilliant cosmologist. He's the, worked out how stellar fusion worked. He was, he's not a trivial guy, but he also was obsessed with the steady state theorem, uh, theory that the universe always existed and then hydrogen atoms were popping into existence every once in a while. And so that there would need no beginning or end. It was an eternal universe and all of that. Yeah. And he also had an anti-evolution streak and, uh, to him. And, uh, so he had a lot of contrarian sides to him. Wallace had some contrarian sides to him. He was an anti-vaxxer, uh, and of course he got to be spiritualist and he was a socialist. Uh, so he, uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff that made him the weirdest 
um, uh, poster child for intelligent design that they tried to invoke after the fact. You know, do you really, do you really want Alfred Wallace uh, as your figure here? He's more complicated than you than you really need here. So what I'm contending is is that if you look at everything from a methods direction you can start seeing these kind of uh, Tortukan traits in embryo at all levels of behavior. Some have them as little minor foibles uh, because they may have a little itty bitty rut, they're just a thing they don't like and they just, and you just can't get past them on it. But others have a much broader rut, an ideology that can get them into trouble. Mark Hauser uh, is an example of an excellent scientist who really got himself into trouble because clearly he had hobby horses about what he thought primate minds were. And he was getting down to the point where he was actually browbeating graduate students that, uh, as to what they were supposedly to observe in experiments. And uh, he lost his post and there was a big hoo-ha flap about it uh, there. Well, my, my Tortukan alert mm, 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 <laughs> yeah. would be going off on that one. And you can see all the little traits in it. So just because somebody is an evolutionist scientist, don't presume they can't have some Tortukan traits knocking around. And that, that if everybody confuses this by thinking it's just about religion, uh, they're going to miss the, the, the reasons why it's occurring. It just happens to be occurring for religious people with a different set of subjects than it would if you happen to be a non-religious person. The Tortukan mind can map onto all sorts of stuff. And here's the toughest thing I keep on having to remind people. Tortukans can map onto things that are true. You could have a mindset where everything you believe is true, but you're still a Tortukan. You're, you're tunnel visiony, you're, you're addicted to secondary sources, that you happen to be addicted to secondary sources that say things that are true, um, but that doesn't mean you aren't. So those methods problems, they're not if and only if. That the, 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 the addiction to secondary sources, the limited data field, the failure to work out what you think happened, and the inability to change your mind, those things don't necessarily correlate with religion or intellect or content. They're a methods issue and a scholarly issue. And they can manifest with correct data fields and incorrect data fields. And once you get past that to where now you're looking at the, 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 the fiddly bit nuts and bolts of arguments, now you can maybe you'll knock some people off pedestals. Um, there, are, there are some people in the scientific community that people get oogly boogly over uh, that I have at arm's length because I see how they approach the data field. Paul Ehrlich um, has a lot of methods baggage. Uh, knocking around in him. He's, uh, uh, and, and so uh, uh, I'm wanting to discuss climate change issues. I'm going to try to avoid Paul Ehrlich as much as possible uh, because he has some uh, a little Tortugan traits knocking around. And um, you get a lot of these things where don't be thrown off by, oh, they've got PhDs. PhDs can have their head up their ass. It's happened before. Yeah, <laughs> It will right. happen again. There's no, it's not a... Uh, uh, a, uh, a panacea for things, and especially if people are not prone to looking at source data. Um, too many of the things uh, that lasted as long as they did, Piltdown being an obvious example, was in part because everybody kind of relied upon the authority mechanisms. And two world wars intervened too, which, which you know, upset the apple cart on there. Um, let's see what's going on over in the comments out here. Yeah. Um, that uh, Robert Richard, that's why they say that evolution equal atheism, even though there are top level scientists who devout Christians, such as Collins, Miller, and uh, Backer. Uh, I wouldn't exactly call Backer a top level scientist, but never, he's an interesting character. He a, 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 has a Lutheran ministry, I think. Uh, Miller's a Roman Catholic. Collins, I'm not sure what Collins is, whether he's, yeah. uh, I think he's an evangelical uh, Christian. Uh, but I, I'd point out um, Conway Morris. Uh, the paleontologist, Robert Asher. However, there is a caveat about people's religion. And that is um, that in a lot of their cases, they will be classified as liberal religionists. In other words, they are not assuming that the Bible is inerrant or they're not assuming that the Tower of Babel story really happened. They're metaphorists. Yeah. And if you probe a lot of that, um, they're not necessarily in the same boat. Whereas anti-evolutionists, are much more doctrinally uh, distinct. 
uh, they do yeah. tend to be inerrantists. They do tend to be doctrinal purists. Even the, the old earth creationists and intelligent designers uh, don't really allow there to be any Bible problems uh, going on. They don't like to think about a lot of it, but that's more their little Tartuk and Rutz imply. Uh, yeah, Bacher was the guy who figured out dinosaurs were warm-blooded and built the case for most of what we know today, for sure, is what Robert just said. So, uh, Yeah, well, yeah, but, uh, he's a fascinating character. Uh, um, he, uh, he's a prickly one. He's, he's not... Uh, he is not unrespected, but he's also not one that a lot of paleontologists will defer to just because it's backer. He's a little bit of a bomb thrower. Uh, he's entertaining uh, and sharply informed. He still does a few technical papers now and then, not a lot. Uh, so he's kind of off in the edge zone. Um, and he's fun to read and watch, but... Um, as in often the case on things, the science has moved on. <laughs> and, but he was one of the very early ones pushing hot-blooded dinosaurs. And on that one, well, Lynn Margulis is yet another example. There's a perfect, uh, that makes um, um, Margulis, her, um, she did not invent endosymbiosis as a concept, but she certainly helped popularize it. But she also had a lot of wacky beliefs. And um, uh, and pushed a lot. Uh, it was sort of endosymbiosis on steroids. She thought speciation was an endosymbiotic process, and I could never figure out what the hell she thought by that. And neither could anybody else who quizzed her about it for years and years and years. And so she's another one who is a one that you always want to put up a little flag that be careful how you use her <laughs> because she's got weird baggage and stuff knocking around. Very talented, prickly. Uh, within her domain, she was a very skilled microbiologist and bacteriologist. She knew that stuff inside out, but she would shoot her mouth off in areas outside of that and, yeah. um, uh, and, and got to be the authority quote for an, a, a lot of creation. Same way Paul Ehrlich did and all that. You know, yeah. when anybody tends to shoot their mouth off, uh, Colin Patterson, who I discuss quite a lot in, in um, uh, Slam Dunk, is one another one of those who's an evolutionist who just couldn't figure out how to shut up. And he would make these statements and again, repeatedly, even when he knew he was, was going to get into trouble about stuff, he just would blunder in on it. And um, uh, you know, Robert uh, uh, brings up... Um, Mary Schweitzer. I was going to mention her, but I was going to let you feel like, yeah, Mary Schweitzer is one who has, whose work has been quote mine so bad. Yeah. By... And she's naturally pissed about it. Yeah. That, that, I don't blame uh, her. The, uh, when you're, when your own work is being misrepresented by people, yeah. uh, that's on your turf. And yeah. the same way when Michael B was misrepresenting uh, um, uh, Tom Cavalier Smith, who was a um, uh, immune system researcher, um, boy, did he light in to be he with a vengeance uh, oh, yeah. in a uh, in the yeah. review of uh, Darwin's Black Box, and it's revealing that be he never responded to it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would almost be like if I became an engineer, I found this really, really great new way to design something. Like I almost redesigned the wheel. And I had someone trying to misconstrue, misconstrue that to say, oh, no, he's actually saying it's this, which isn't great at all. Or, oh, it supports the old way of doing it, and he didn't do anything new. I'd be like, <laughs> no, I, I would not I would not take that lying down. I'd be like, no, you're lying about what I did. Here's what it is. Now shut up. And, and I know Mary Spicer is the same way. I mean – I would be one person who you don't want to rile up. Yeah, and uh, and understandable because one is always in a good position uh, uh, to defend one's own work. Yeah, uh, and uh, the knowledgeable feel on the subject, and uh, she's she's not unrespected in the sciences. There's the, the the only little quibbly area that needed to be covered and was covered was the extent to which they had isolated against contamination, because it was very easy in some of these cases to where very subtle contamination of DNA could upset your measurements. Uh, but the kinds of stuff that they were looking at are very, very different uh, because they were looking at actual soft tissue, tiny microscopic fragments and so forth and so on, which of course creation has then turned into vast swaths of blood spurting tissue. Oh, yes. Still, still yeah, soft it, it tissue. Like yeah, that you can see in a microscope that you can't see with the naked eye because they're yeah. trapped down inside of 
sealed bone that yeah. has gotten by the wonders of things uh, sealed iron away compounds. to where nothing will decay. Yeah, it, it was an iron compound they found out was actually interacting with the bone yeah, there, I believe. And, and that's what kept the, those little tiny specks alive. And it's like, okay, if you read what they found, you would know it's not for what you're trying to say. It was an iron compound or something in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, Robert, Robert says he was surprised that Behe, Michael Behe, can show his face in public after what Brown uh, uh, um, did to him uh, in the uh, Kitzmiller trial. Um, uh, or uh, um, uh, Miller, uh, I think you're thinking of uh, not, not Brown. Anyway, um, the, uh, I, I can easily see Behe showing his face in public because he is a true believer. And so he has his irreducible complexity arguments, and he'll trot that out at a moment's notice. And uh, again, as I uh, showed in his chloroquine case in uh, Slam Dunk, um, this is a guy that just doesn't change his views based on new information. He can't seem to see new information. He would just repeat the mantras over and over and over again. And the moment you start looking at the primary source data material, uh, you could realize, yipes, this guy is just not getting it. And it's one of the reasons why the actual biology department uh, in the, at Lehigh University is not exactly thrilled with him. Um, he has his little niche worldview in there. He's got his tenure, and so he's, he's uh, going to continue as he is. But um, you've got um, uh, people with, with academic credentials who have their own philosophical access to crying and for no, don't ever expect that to stop. Human beings are human beings. Anything, it's a social institution. Uh, oh, Robert asks, uh, uh, have I ever sat down and actually read the transcripts posted online on the court website of the Kitzmiller trial? Be he admitted he had not read any of the primary sources. Oh gosh, that's obvious. Yeah. Oh yeah. And um, was, yeah the, the transcripts are always fun to read, yeah. Yeah. Um, he um, uh, had never bothered researching. What was, what was so clear, uh, even in the case of um, the one example that he was trotting out um, on the uh, uh, impapenum, I've got it up at, at my uh, Bain Tip website. It's in Tip 1.7, uh, where he was trying to argue that um, uh, the uh, impapenum resistance was um, of representing the limits of um, natural mutation. And uh, that, that, that when you looked at the one source he was drawing off of and how superficial his understanding of it was. And then he trotted the same example out years later in his book, even though no, more work had developed. And when I investigated the background details of it, it was so different from the little cartoon he was doing that um, you realize that this is a way of peeking into the guy's head. This is really useful material, source methods, because you're, you're going under the hood so, so to continue back, because we're actually technically past yeah. our hour, uh, mm -hmm. but to, 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 to reprise the, why that matters so much, that source method, is that when you look at a book like the one we're analyzing here in, in this series, or anything at the source methods level, when they make a claim and they cite a source, and they think that supposedly means what they claim it does, and you discover that it doesn't, that's telling you about what's going on in their head. You have to figure out what kind of motivations are involved in it. In some cases, they may have nicked it secondarily, and they're just repeating somebody else's trope. And so they've never bothered to read the original material. Uh, in other cases, no, they cited the material on their own. It's their original argument. But are they reading close? Are they not looking at the, th the, 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 the details? And then when you peel back the argument, one of the things that will really pop out is the failure to do map of time, the yeah, failure to think through what they think happened. This is, this is not a, a hard thing to find. This is impossible to find. Literally no examples anywhere in the anti-evolution literature that I know of, of anybody working through what they think happens with the data field from their perspective. So we don't know. Uh, um, I, I didn't mention it last week, and, I, and, and uh, I'll, I'll call attention to it on this one. Um, uh, Gunther Beckley is continuing. He's the, the paleontologist, German insect paleontologist, who has apparently got religion. He's turned into a Roman Catholic, and now he's an intelligent design advocate. 
And uh, he's been doing a series of things on human evolution. I mentioned several of them along the way. And the latest one that just popped up was on the Cambrian explosion. You can find it at, at uh, the Discovery Institute, uh, where he's preening about these uh, fossils. And they're, they're, they're these uh, uh, Fuxian Hua, I think, uh, it's from China. And how uh, we know a lot about it now. And we know about its nervous system and its brood behavior and all these things. And it's so complicated and wonderful and intricate. And so it's basically a gee whiz argument. Yeah. Um, I was, and yet, I don't know what he thinks happened. Uh, I don't know whether or not he thinks anything alive today was alive in the Cambrian. Is it descent? Is anything alive now descended from anything in the Cambrian? I don't have any idea that he has ever thought about that. It's all just the little compartmentalization. So even though uh, he is a, a, a normal paleontologist on systematics and the like. Um, I'm not sure he has a functioning map of time in his head and therefore what he thinks happens is something that we're never going to hear. Uh, other people is beyond me have spotted the fact that he never tells us what he thinks happened with the human evolution examples he's been doing. Uh, Robert asks, um, uh, what is the current creationist position on the coherent picture we get from DNA analysis of H neanderthalensis in comparison to H sapiens, how do they account for H erectus's range? Um, well, I'm not sure what we have. Uh, I'll, I'll be looking to see in this whole chapter whether or not they're citing stuff on what we have in, in terms of, of H erectus's DNA. But in terms of the morphological relationship, um, uh, I'm going to be seeing whether or not they've cited anything at all on it. Um, we, in their Neanderthal, uh, section. They didn't really go into the work that's already starting to appear on why the Neanderthals at the genetic level end up looking the way they do. Yeah. So there's a, a, been a they found juvenile uh, Neanderthals. Uh, so they can now see that the, the, the actual developmental biology of the muscle, or, uh, the bones, uh, from a juvenile to adult. And it turns out they're very different from humans. They've got some different growth patterns that are unique to Neanderthals. They're not like us. And um, uh, that ultimately has genetic elements. There's things about tooth eruption modalities and the like that they've been able to determine uh, that, that uh, just reinforce the fact, no, they're not just deformed human beings. Uh, they're just a little farther off the map in here. So the, the, the short answer then, Robert, is they don't pay attention to it. They don't notice the data. They don't include all the data. The idea that you would want to pull together that primary source data field, not opinions, not secondary sources, but the actual data field, and have your clear idea of what you propose happens, and then you test it out with the data field, and you try to work out predictions about what new data should exist, if your model is true, that shouldn't be true with the opposition, or vice versa, and that's how you can test them. That never happens in anti-evolutionism. You don't know what they think happened. And you don't know what they would accept as evidence because nothing will be acceptable as evidence. There can be no transitional forms. There can be no transitional sequences. There, it must never be the case. And the moment you try asking them, well, what would you accept? You'll get deer in the headlight. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah. And that's 100% failure, right? And that's telling us what's, I can't say what's going on in their head. It's what's not going on in their head. Yeah, and, and actually... David last system earlier and it, and I agree with it. It was one of the things that I thought it would be and it actually fits into that of what would they accept? Nothing. Cause it talks about B was presented with all the textbooks and papers and all the, and everything else that goes with it on the evolution of the digestion. But I thought it was the immune system. I, I could be wrong on that, but one of them and he's never read it and goes, Oh, that's not good enough. And what's really bad is B he even admits under his own definition of, intelligent design or of how science is that even astrology would be considered science if intelligent design was allowed that's another fun one that's like yeah, yeah he, he, he had a lot of blowing his foot off uh with his own yeah. guns I, yeah. um uh, problem but but the the, the, the thing about be he is a gigantic double standard I'd called attention to this. If you want to see a lot about my take on um, the irreducible complexity issues and a lot of the design arguments, creationism light chapter at tip. I know we're running a little past the time, but you know, I'll, I'll finish this one. Um, is that Behe wants everybody else to do the work. He's like the Donald Trump of, of uh, intelligent design where he doesn't have to do any of the work. 
No, he can scavenge little bits and pieces and and show all of these doubts and wonderful. Uh, and evolutionists, however, have to explain these systems at the point mutation level. All the possible steps have to they have to work out all of that work. But when you ask him, well, what is your design model? Well, I don't have to do that. We want, we may do this one of these days. No, excuse me, uh, Michael, but you need to do that too. If you're trying to dislodge evolution, you can't just come in and, and supposedly just prove it as a negative argument. You have to offer your alternative and show you can explain the data at all, let alone or preferably better. But we don't know yeah. that he can really explain that at all. And so there's a gigantic double standard. He wants to sit back popping the champagne corks and toasting to the death of Darwinism uh, without having to do the work. Sorry, doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, um, I think we have uh, reached the end of this far-ranging discussion. And remember, we only mentioned Uranus once. So uh, that's the uh, uh, the end of this little show. There will be more. I'm sure I'll, I'll be uh, plowing through uh, their Homo erectus chapter to see. I put little notes in the thing. Okay, are they going to talk about the genetics and things to explain for these morphological variations that we see in the Homo erectus populations or, or not? They, they promise that they're going to. Um, <laughs> Well, but, but, uh, uh, Robert says, I'd be fine with them popping the champagne gourds if they actually did that, but they just lie and, and expect us to swallow it. But, but here's the important point, Robert. From their perspective, he's telling the truth. He, be he is, is, is re repeating mantras, but he believes those mantras. He's got his hobby horses that he believes he has established these fixed things. and. Uh, um, at that point, uh, there's no maneuvering. Uh, he, he's just got his little line in the sand drawn and he's fixed in it. He tried to get rid of the reptile mammal transition uh, via this chloroquine resistance argument that the number of mutations required to produce chloroquine resistance is so unlikely, even though it seems to occur a lot, um, that uh, anything that was more unlikely than that functionally can't occur in the things needed for the reptile mammal transition, which he did not explore at all, no sources, nothing, um, theoretically was beyond that pale. So he's theoretically jujitsu the reptile mammal transition off the field with chloroquine resistance. Problem is he got his chloroquine argument wrong. And, and it was painfully wrong when you looked at the phys physical details and the follow-up research where it was clear nature was not following Michael Behe's cue sheet. Uh, so there, there's a, there's another reason for everybody to get uh, evolution slam dunk, damn it, uh, so yeah. that everybody can have read that and go, hey, now I know what the hell Jim's talking about. Plus, the the RJ needs the royalties. So yeah. <laughs> RJ, you anyway, self plugging, are you? Oh, you bet. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm uh, I can always need a little bit of of, of self plugging there because uh, uh, you can tell when I'm I'm comfortably off is when I won't need to self plug. Uh, which I would love to be in a position where I didn't have to scrape around for things. But um, uh, I can guarantee that, that no one will be disappointed with evolution slam dunk, uh, that you'll you'll learn the most spectacular case. Uh, I'll just quote Christine Janice. You can read her review at Amazon.com. Uh, she's a mammal paleontologist and not easily pleased uh, that um, she calls my work an, an incredible tour de force. And... Um, and if anybody out there uh, knows of a, a, a publisher who can uh, uh, swing an illustrated edition of it, uh, put them in touch with me because I'd like to have that going because that's the one thing it needed was pictures, but I didn't have the, the wherewithal to be able to track down any of the illustrations in there. So there's no pictures in it. So um, um, come on, social network gang. Uh, scrape me up uh, a good publisher and or browbeat anybody that you know, who knows people who know literary agents, etc. somewhere out there, somebody must know. What is this, this the, the, the world of interconnections we've got? Uh, somebody must know somebody. Anyway, I'm, I'm a lowly little guy here in Spokane and uh, I'm, I'm trying the best I can under the circumstances and plugging away on um, the, uh, the rest of the thing. But yeah, every, everybody get evolution slam dunk. It's uh, a good addition to your bookshelf. Uh, let your libraries know about it. Um, uh, some libraries may not want to get it, but others may. And uh, so that also is matter. The information can't do a damn bit of good uh, if it's not out there. 
uh, yeah, oh, yes, Robert. Yes, it's uh, and uh, uh, they could get it um, uh, just through Amazon.com. Let me um, um, pull up a, a link to it. Uh, do, 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 do. Assuming Word can start up quickly when I've got the uh, computer going on the camera. Sometimes it takes a while. Um, uh, yeah, I think. Oh, there we go. Finally popped up. And um, here we go. I keep a little in my cut and paste uh, sheet uh, so that, that I can lob this on everybody. There we go. Voila. Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's um, available, and uh, it only takes like a couple days, even with the, the bargain basement. Uh, delivery thing. So yeah, they can order it as a real live book. And um, um, so it's not like it's inaccessible. Uh, even bookstores that don't particularly like working through Amazon have actually acquired it. So um, uh, this is not an um, uh, impossible task for them. There we go. So, uh, and uh, if you if you like fiction, uh, you can uh, might as well plug the other one here because I do have a novel. Yeah, and um, really good. And Cap can, can yes, Cap can say that it's it's yeah. I I'm not a bad slowly movie. but surely getting through it. I've been focusing more on my own one lately, but yeah, I have a friend who is a huge Vern fan, and I mean, I I don't know of anybody who likes Jules Vern more than her. Um, <laughs> and she really liked it. It's I mean, she said it was very well done and you know, just really, just a really good novel. I, she didn't go into too many details, so she didn't spoil it for me, but said there were some differences, but overall, so you still got a prodder to person. write a review uh, yeah. on, uh, on Amazon. Okay. So um, I will, I, I, yeah, she's really busy right now. So uh, I have to prod uh, everybody on these. I had to prod Christine Janice to, to write her review. You know, she she was just thrilled with the book, and I go, "Oh, really? Would you mind saying so, so that I, in, uh, at Amazon, so other people could notice this?" And, I wrote uh, my review for Evolution Slam Dunk, so I believe it was <laughs> Evolution Slam Dunk. So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll talk to her again about writing the review. I can't guarantee anything. She's yeah. going to school for engineering right now, so if you know anything on them, they. Uh, life uh what life yeah it's all focused on on the technical yeah. thing yeah. yeah yeah just to robert that uh um the work is uh documented with uh, a slam dunk is documented with about 2300 sources it's uh, a full comprehensive survey of a mass of technical literature not only in the reptile mammal transition but related stuff and it's also gives a good introduction to things so even if you knew nothing at all about the creation evolution controversy you'll know the basic players of the field and a lot of the current controversies and stuff and there will be uh, there's uh, sources that would relate to on that but the the big gun is the reptile mammal transition because it's uh, was one that was very badly covered very few people discussed it you got little snippets like a page or two in Jerry Coyne or um, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, once in a while, but that's about it. And no criticism of the creationists on this subject. The problem partly would be that almost all of the, of the big mistakes they're making uh, were in their books. And if you didn't know about those books, you wouldn't realize all this material is relatively little online. Uh, the online stuff, uh, Wood Morap's article and uh, one of Dwayne Gish's and stuff, I go into all of that too. But so I survey literally everybody and it's only like 20 people, but it's still, the, it's a 100% failure rate that that when, when you bring up the reptile mammal transition, you will literally not only know the science, you will know every possible counter argument that they can give to the reptile mammal transition because I went through and pulled them all apart. So you're just, you will just be waiting there for them to finish the sentence before you drop an anvil on them. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a I had a friend who I got into um, a message discussion with about evolution one time, and I, I, I had literally, I don't remember which one it was, but I literally read part of that in your book, RJ, and I was like, oh, you did not just go there. I just read that, I flipped open to it, and I was like, yep, here you go. Here's where you're wrong. 
I didn't hear anything. It should be available at Amazon UK. I've had I've had book sellings from people who I'm sh I'm positive have bought it through UK. So absolutely, let me know um, um, whether or not uh, it isn't available through there. And if not, uh, and it's available in Kindle if you're if you're an ebook reader. And uh, there's uh, Nook and uh, other versions that are aren't as fancy. Uh, the 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 print version is available in that same modality for Kindle um, because I was able to pay attention to a lot of little font changes and stuff and th that was much harder to do uh, for the uh, the Nook version. Um, anyway, yeah, it, it should be uh, available in that context. It's uh, a pretty hefty little thing. Um, and um, the... the <laughs> the uh, the reference list is in small print runs a hundred pages, so yeah. it's it's, it's I, really well documented. Yeah, <laughs> I, I need. I swear, I need like a, my eyes aren't that great to begin with, and when I saw that, I'm like, okay, I need to get out the magnifying glass for this one. It is. It's very <laughs> very low lowercase, and it's uh it is hard to read, but they are there. If you have yeah. Eyes, well, I, 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 I wanted to. Glass. I wanted to hit all the field. To where anybody that that was familiar with the current science picture would not go well. Downer certainly isn't up to speed. Uh, I was delighted when Jan Janice uh, told me that she had was now revising some of her new mammal book based on some of the information that I had brought to her attention in my book. I'm going okay. That's good, um, and that that reinforced the fact that I'm. I've been told by others, uh, uh, Dr. Lowe from the University of or of. of um, Carnegie in, in Chicago, uh, who I've often gotten technical papers in that from, and vetted my old Woodmarap article too back in 2006. Uh, he complimented me that if had I wanted to go into systematics, I have the mind for it. I'm very methodical and, and attention to detail, and I, I, I move rather quickly in this area. So I'm, I'm not the doofus, at least. <laughs> oh, Richard uh, says, yeah. says it is available. Good. Well, then the, there you have a perfect, perfect operation. Go through Amazon UK. And um, I use yeah. American spellings. Yeah. Uh, it, and um, yeah, uh, Robert, it's um, it's not that hefty. It's you know, I mean, it's what about I think eight hundred. I think it might be actually be like seven hundred pages, like a hundred of it are references. I, like I said, when I wrote my review, the worst thing I could say about it was it reads like a textbook at times. It's not a <laughs> thrilling page turner. It's not, I'll be honest. But it's very, very informative. Yeah, Janice's favorite section is when I dismantled Dembski and Wells. And uh, because she's had a particular dislike for them. And she also loved the part about um, uh, Colin Matt Patterson because uh, it resonated with what she knew about Patterson. And she exchanged some uh, stories with me about, about him uh, that uh, were not public knowledge. So it, it was very reinforcing. Uh, I do my homework. <laughs> um, uh, it's a weird thing to have moved from a novel format where I'm in one mode to a non-novel. Uh, in a different context, the uh, I'm almost finished with the second fog novel, and then uh, one after that, then will be another science book, and I'll be alternating back and forth that way. Uh, the next science book will be on the Discovery Institute's um, Descent from Darwin list, which is another one that has not been properly dealt with by anybody before, other than one thing at Rational Wiki. Uh, they've not really ferreted through all the names on the list, especially since they're like the 11, 1100 in the current thing. Find out. Just how do they break down? Where are they on the scientific landscape? Are these heavy guns in the field? How many of them are creationist ideologues or not? Uh, you know, where where are they on this landscape? Oh, are these people who are signing this descent from Darwin really representing a cutting edge of anything? Yes. Uh, and, Robert Richardson. Yeah, if there's a YouTuber, uh, uh, various uh, people have taken a look at it. It yeah, could be and, the same guy that did the thing at Rational Wiki. He alphabetized them for one. That was necessary. It's highly revealing that it is now alphabetical. But yeah, give, give me a, a link on that um, um, in the comments afterwards or um, uh, put, put the link up to that, Robert, if you will, um, yeah. on that, because I haven't, I haven't spotted that one. Yeah, and I was going um, to say, and a lot, and some of those people on the list want their name removed, and they won't because they were like, 
uh, one of the ways that I, I kind of heard about it was that they were more or less, they were like, oh, okay, are we willing to question what evolution says? Well, yeah, I mean, name one scientist that doesn't want to question things that are there because yeah, if it you was, can disprove it, guess what? It you was would very be carefully worded overnight. Although it's fair to say that the vast majority of the signatories are anti evolutionists who yeah. know exactly wink, wink, nudge, nudge what it yeah, signifies. I think so anyway, someone, we're all, we're, I'm, I'm yeah. about halfway past uh, the point of where I was supposed to be stopping already. So I will now be stopping the broadcast. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the show. And, um, We'll have more of these as long as we can go, because uh, so long as, as you're benefiting from what I'm doing, I'm more than happy to uh, be contributing to things. And uh, the more we can gather together and create a network of like-minded people where, where we can share and build on each other's knowledge to make our collective impact better, I think that's an important thing to do. We don't have a science strike force network in existence yet. We're just uh, too many disparate, disconnected cadres, and uh, we're, we're getting better, and we have the tools available. I mean, everybody with these stupid things, you know, have instantaneous communication linkages and all that, so we, we're able to, to link up way better than we were even five or ten years ago, so let's make the most of it, gang. Okay, so we are now stopping the broadcast, and and please, uh, Robert, put that link in there about the uh, the YouTuber on the uh, uh, Discovery Institute list. I may have heard about it or not. It may be the same person from Rational Wiki. I don't know, but at any rate, it's uh, an important um, topic which needs to be on the front burner. Uh, and um, I've got um, oh, I, I can't turn my camera around to pick it up, but I got a great big stack of material, and I would be making use of the fact that the list has grown over the years to where it's up to about 1,100 names, but it's it's how it's grown, where the new names are put. Why are they at the beginning, at the end, the sprinkled around, and it's all structured to make it hard to find out who's on it and who's added. And uh, then, of course, I want to break down um, their their collegiate affiliates and a lot of other stuff. Um, I know already there's a, a, in the analysis that I'd started that there's a cluster from the University of Oklahoma in there. So I'm assuming they knew each other. And uh, so you, you, they're, 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 you can only find out the, the full coordination of things when you start breaking down for a meta-analysis. Anyway, uh, I, I keep on dithering too long. <laughs> yeah.